the Big Hole National Battlefield is located 20 minutes west of Wisdom, Montana. The open spaces are made up of grazing fields, wildlife, and a mountain range that sits on the state line of Idaho and Montana. Forestry participants break up into two groups during the Big Hole National Battlefield staff ride. A group follows the trail of the Nez Perce tribe starting at the south end of the valley and work their way up to the teepees at the north end. The second group hikes up Battle Mountain until they reach the Howitzer Point where the U.S. Army arrived the evening before the battle. Going back to the year 1877, the region's status was in turmoil due to the Nez Perce War between the Nez Perce tribe and the U.S. Army. August 7th, the fleeing Nez Perce tribe arrived in the valley of the Big Hole and set up a temporary camp. Tall brushes sit alongside the river east of Battle Mountain, overlooking the entire region. 800 Nez Perce tribal members arrive in the Big Hole Valley and set up camp to rest and recover. They have been on the move and defending themselves from the U.S. Army for weeks. Chief Joseph led the Nez Perce people to the familiar territory of the Big Hole Valley. The group was made up of women, children, and men. Among them were 150 warriors who were the tribe's most skilled warriors and in a class of their own. The tribe arrived with 1,500 to 2,000 livestock and horses that were spread out through the campsite. The warriors kept their horses on the hillside, west of the river, opposite of the campsite for tactical and logical reasons, but the rest of the livestock and horses were kept near camp. Chief Joseph was among the many tribes in the region who refused to be relocated to smaller reserved land in Idaho and Washington state by General Howard and the U.S. government. After the Nez Perce War began, many loyal followers agreed to flee up north to Canada and meet up with their ally Sitting Bull of the Lakota tribe for refuge. Fighting and withdrawing for months against the U.S. Army and after the Battle of the Clearwater, they regrouped and rest in the Big Hole Valley before their approach to Canada. From the friendly talks we had had with soldiers in Lolo Pass, we did not suppose there would be any more fighting, especially if we did not disturb the settlers and we had not molested them. The U.S. Army, led by Colonel Gibbons and Lieutenant James H. Bradley, were made up of 160-plus soldiers and volunteers. Among them were young men and aged Civil War veterans. Brought all the officers together and told them that uh, we were going go, to go in light. It's going to be a very quick, short <coughs> battle. Uh, we know they're going to be sleeping. We want to surprise them. Lieutenant Bradley also saw a very large horse herd on the hill opposite of us. He wasn't sure how many there were, but there were quite a few. He uh, was going to take some uh, civilian volunteers with him and go up and uh, try to separate uh, the horses from the, from the camp. Colonel Gibbons uh, had anticipated a rendezvous with General Howard and his men to crush the Nez Perce tribe in this location, but Howard was still days out. John Gibbon, Colonel, Commander, 7th U.S. Infantry. I was born in Pennsylvania in 1827, grew up in North Carolina, and was accepted into the United States Military Academy at West Point as a youth of 15. I graduated 20th in a class of 38 and served with distinction in the Mexican War, the Seminole War, the Civil War. The U.S. Army had been on the heels of the Nez Perce and were assisted not only by horses and carriages, but a howitzer. The howitzer was a cannon from the Civil War era and only a few volunteers knew how to operate. In the morning, boom, you know, raise them up, boom, over it. Uh, the crew here uh, is six guys who said, they said, one, two, three, four, five, six. You are now the mount you are the crew of this gun. They're not trained. It's like taking an AD who has no training, giving them a combi tool. You know, the, there's actually a lot of work involved into shooting a howitzer, and a well-trained crew could fire four shots a minute. That's not a well-trained crew. What we'd like you to do is walk single file and be quiet and just sort of put yourself in the minds of those troops who were filtering through here, trying to maintain that element of su surprise in the early pre-dawn. The night of August 8th, the U.S. Army arrived on the hillside west of the Nez Perce campsite and moved into position next to the river for a surprise attack. During the night, the U.S. Army could see women, children, and men moving around campfires and their silhouettes inside the teepees. I want to, I want to establish in your mind's eye this as a place of relative physical 
and psychological safety. That night, the warriors paraded around camp, singing, all making a good time. It was the first time since war started. Everybody was good feeling. Going to the Buffalo country, no more fighting after Lolo passed. War was quick. All Montana, all Montana citizens are friends. This land had belonged to the Flathead, our old time friend. They called it its, its Kalalampitpa, place of the ground squirrel. The kind you call pocket things. Lots of them hatched here. It was past midnight when we went to bed. Yellow Wolf, next to the swirl. We started, had a light dinner on the 8th. This is now the 9th, the morning of the 9th. We started our, our they walk um, about two hours west of here. We've been sitting along this bank for a couple hours waiting in the chill dawn. And so this, the separation of the horses from the, the tribe is part of the key army doctrine. So that's, that's the plan going in here and then we'll slowly advance. We walked along the toe of the hill and we just sat down and we waited for dawn. We, we knew we weren't that far from the village. We could uh, see light of, uh, of fires. We could hear people talking every once in a while, dogs barking, babies crying. So we knew they were over there. I not know, we did not know what this place looked like in the day. We, had not, we have no idea what's, what's, uh, what's ahead of us. We're gonna sit here, wait till dawn, and then we're gonna move into position in three battalions across, into, up to the village and then fire our three volleys low into the teepees. About one o'clock, we found ourselves on the side of a hill facing the Indian village. A herd of ponies on the crest of the hill in our rear. It was part of a plan to capture the herd. With the exception of the restlessness of the Indian ponies, it was very quiet just at that time, but it was the quiet that precedes the tornado before death and destruction follow. How unsuspicious they are of approaching danger. As the sky in the east began to brighten, the fires began to blaze all, all through the camp, and the troops were sent down into the creek bottom and ordered to push quietly forward through the thick brushwood, wading the sloughs, in some places up to the men's waist. The distance to the stream along the further bank of which the camp was pitched was several, several hundred yards from the bluffs and in some places the brush was so thick and impenetrable that the troops were broken into squads before they got close to the tents. John Gibbon. Before the sun rose early in the morning, a Nez Perce elder walked down to the river and startled a U.S. Army volunteer. Without hesitation, the elder was shot and killed. I understood we were to try and hold the Indian horses. There were about four or five hundred head. I will say, I will say here that the Indians had between two and three thousand horses. An Indian herder came out from the village to look after the horses where we were and ran into the soldier's main command below us. We were six or seven hundred yards from them. As soon as the herder saw them, he started back and was killed there, and the soldiers and citizens charged the village and share a volunteer. Our skirmishers were advanced a short distance where we remained for the signs of coming daylight when a solitary Indian came out from the lodges riding directly towards us, evidently going to their herd of horses. In order for the Indian to reach the horses, he would have to come right through our line and we could not remain long without being discovered. My men had been instructed and the poor devil paid the penalty. Some four or five of the boys helped him on his way. John B. Catlin, Captain of Volunteers. About early morning I was awakened. My father and Chief Yellow Bull were standing, talking low. They thought they saw soldiers across the creek. Next instant, we heard shots from above the creek across the canyon, maybe a quarter mile away. I heard the loud call, we are attacked. Then I heard two shots and another loud halo. We are attacked, we are attacked. After these two or three shots, there came a big heavy firing. Soldiers soon came rushing among the teepees, bullets flying everywhere. Red Elk, Mimipu, child, 10 years old. The U.S. Army men fired at the teepees as the Nez Perce scrambled around the camp and gathered families for extraction while the warriors fought back. Cold and remembering a horsehair robe, I ran back to get it. While doing this, bullets passed through the teepee. Guns were barking. I heard some yell, we are attacked. It was a useless call. Must have been somebody just roused from slumber. Black Eagle, son of Wakolin. 16 years. In the meantime, War Chief Looking Glass rallied the warriors to create a defense line to hold off the attackers. 
The U.S. Army men were lined up along the river, deep in the brushes, firing from a safe distance and well covered. Whether by accident or intent would be the signal for the charge on the Indian camp. Yes. And so there was that first shot was for that uh, elder uh, Nimi Poo person who was coming out to, to try to investigate what, the, what was going on with the horses because he was hearing the horses whinny and stuff. My brothers, our teepees are on fire. Get ready your arms. Make resistance. You are here for that purpose. 15 years. 15 years old. Okay. Kautilix, who I mentioned down on the far end, was a 16-year-old kid. He wasn't the chief of nothing. So. And then you got to look at, you know, where the where the willows come out. That's a long ways. Two moons. My wife started up, but I told her to lie down close to the ground. Bullets were singing through the teepee, splintering the poles. They came thick, like summer hail. For a time, I did not dare raise up. Shouts and war hoops mingled with firing and children and women crying. At last I sprang up, got my rifle from the pole, and rushed out to meet the soldiers. An officer soon stopped me and wanted me to help burn the teepees. This was attempted, but found them too wet, so I left and went down to the creek for a short distance when I saw two squaws. One of them holding a papoose near a bunch of willows that had become uprooted and had fallen in the water. I pulled my pistol and I took aim at the old squaw who was holding the child. I was a good shot, aimed right at her head, but she did not waver a particle. She looked me in the eye and say I began to think, why should I shoot an Indian woman, one who had never injured me a bit in the world? I put up my gun and left. A little later in the day I heard a fellow bragging that he had killed those two women. I could never have forgiven myself if I had been that man. Tom Sherrill, volunteer. Willicott's teepee was on the lower west side of the camp down creek. Chief Joseph's teepee stood a little way above. More people were killed about Joseph's teepee. While Tix was killed, he had helped start the war. His wife was killed immediately after. She shot the soldier who had killed her husband. She was the only woman to do fighting. They all ran to hide in the creek or brush. I ran to the lower side of the camp. By this time, the Indians began to rally and drive the whites back through the camp and across the creek. After we got across that flame creek, we did not know what to do. We seemed to be waiting for orders. And as we were bunched together, the Indians behind the big tree were simply giving us hell. The fact that we were so close together that he couldn't miss us, several were killed right here. I heard Gibbons give <clears throat> the command to scatter, then came the order to take the timbered point away from him and entrench. Charge that point and rake the brush with your rifles was the command. Tom Sherrill, volunteer. We don't really hear very much what happened to those guys other than the Tom Sherrill reading, waiting for some orders, but uh, that's just an intriguing um, question to me is these are not regular army and uh, they're, even if, I mean, you know, they're not regular army, but they do, do have a leader, but now they don't have a leader. So not only are, don't they have the training, the whatever the procedures of the regular army, now they don't even have a leader. So he ordered his men to stop pursuing the Nez Perce and to sweep the willows for survivors and torch the camp. Within one half hour, the Nez Perce warriors were firing back into the camp, as we just started to hear. Gibbon would later say that he lost more men briefly holding the camp than he had in capturing it. He's forced to withdraw back across the river to the shelter of this wooded spot we just heard about at the base of the mountain. He forces their, w their way onto the hill to establish a defensive perimeter and await the inevitable. Um, we really didn't trust the volunteers. Um, they weren't soldiers for the most part. Some had fought in the Civil War, but not too many had. So they were, they were, they were, they were just uh, out for adventure. And that's, what, that's why they were along this, on, on this journey. You know, we, are, we, we don't generally like volunteers too much. Um, and in fact, after this, <laughs> we won't. We, there won't be any more volunteers, mm -hmm. because uh, if you, you know, if we all saw the movie, um, you know, the volunteers started this war at Whitebird, you know, by shooting at the flag of truth com coming out. So uh, it's, you know, the volunteers are, are on their way out. And in fact, part of the the thinking was to get the volunteers 
out and away. So in part that was why they wanted them in front and up with the horse herd because then they weren't engaged as much. And yet, as we've just sort of heard, not only did they engage, they fell apart when their commander was, was killed and that they then got sucked back into, in the absence of, a, of another leader emerging from this, they moved back into the center of camp, which created a significant opening that you'll hear a lot more about. While the U.S. Army continued their unexpected early surprise attack, Chief Joseph began gathering the women and children and elders to escape out of the valley opposite of the river. During the evacuation process, War Chief Looking Glass began the counterattack. Uh, leaders, both appointed and emergent, are rallying warriors, and warriors are firing back into their own village. Most people have fled outside the village. Warriors from outside the village are firing back into the village. Since the world was made, brave men fight for their women and children. Are we going to run to the mountains and let the whites kill our women and children before our eyes? It's better we should be fight killed fighting. Now is our time. Fight! Shoot them down! We can shout as well as any of these soldiers. Pio, Pio! Pio, Pio, hi, hi. White Bird, Nimipu, chief and noted warrior. The soldiers did not get through the brush to our part of the camp. Only a very few warriors with guns, maybe three or five, held them from crossing the river. With others, I ran for our horses. They were bunched further down the river, badly scared. We had trouble getting around them. A good distance from camp, I heard the cry go up, soldiers are defeated. Black Eagle, son of Wotlinen, 16 years. White people believed that as the soldiers came out of the, out of the water, you know, Indians came rushing forth from their teepees fully armed, like they had been sleeping with rifles in their, under their robes, uh, including women and children. And, and the, the facts just don't bear that out. I heard the voice of an Indian calling to the warriors to drive the soldiers from the camp. Many had no guns, but the few who did have them rallied, and soldiers began to drop. In the meantime, Nez Perce warriors mounted their horses and raced towards the howitzer, before it was operational. Within minutes, the howitzer was completely overrun and the operators fled or were killed by the Nez Perce warriors. A couple of the Nez Perce warriors knew how to operate the howitzer and began firing on the U.S. Army men in the tree line and tall brushes. Numerous U.S. Army men positioned in the tall brushes were not aware of the warriors' flank until the howitzer fired on them. During the evacuation process, War Chief Looking Glass began the counterattack. The warriors approached the hill unnoticed and laid down heavy fire on the tree line rally point with long range rifles. The distance was so great, the infantrymen couldn't see the muzzle fire from the hillside. They started and we young men went back to watch the soldiers the rest of the evening. We watched them overnight until next morning. We heard the soldiers crying in the night. They were starving perhaps and dying for water. All I could Chief Joseph's brother announced, let us quit and leave the soldiers alone. Let us go with the tribe. The Indians took pity on the soldiers and they were hungry themselves. Soldiers were crying, won't put their heads out, won't fight anymore. So we left them and followed the band. We have an account on the water detail that uh, they were so scared when they went around gathering canteens, they uh, went down there, didn't even get a drink themselves. They filled up canteens and they got right back here. They, they didn't want to. They didn't want to be outside the lines any longer than they absolutely had to. And by them stopping to get a drink, they would have. They, they think they might have risked their lives. So they they skedaddled back up here. Let's remember, they're on light rations. They're on this army bread, also called hardtack. It's uh, that's what they've been eating the day before when they're up camped at Trail Creek. And, and if they would have brought any of it, that's what would have been with them. That's all they have. Day drawing on, I went back to camp. Many of the teepees were ashes, some of the blackened poles still standing. I inquired for my wife and little child. Bad news came about them. When I reached the teepees, escaped from the burning, standing at the end, my wife and baby had both been shot. During the day, when fight came on again, I did not leave the teepee. I had to care for my wounded wife and child. 
The warriors fought the soldiers in the trenches the entire night. On the morning of the 10th, the Indians had nearly all disappeared. About 15 of their best warriors still hung around our, our breastworks, firing an occasional volley among us. On the evening of the 10th, Hugh Kirkendall, who had charge of the transportation for General Gibbons, came down with the teams and provisions. This was the first mouthful of food we had had since Wednesday night when we left camp for the battle. John B. Catlin, Captain of the Volunteers. Yellow Wolf, we came back to find, our, to find part of our village in ruins. This teepee here was standing and silent. Inside we found two women lying in their blankets dead. Both had been shot. The mother had her newborn baby in her arms. His head was smashed as by a gun breech or a boot heel. Some soldiers acted with crazy minds. The fighting now stopped for a while, the Indians returning to the camp. They all cried when they saw what they had, what had been done. So many killed everywhere. Men, women, and children lay dead among dead soldiers and burned teepees and bedding. Red Elk, Nez Pierce Warrior. What made Joseph so hostile was the killing of some of their women and children by accident, as we were told not to shoot the squaws, and I honestly can say it was not done on purpose. Homer Coon, Private 7th Infantry. Early morning came news that Rainbow and Five Wounds, Red Moccasin Tops, and Shore Crossing had been killed. Four best fighters of the Nez Perce tribe. This touched my feeling, laid me low and downhearted. I did not want to attend the battle further. The camp moved. I went with them. These are those elite warriors that, that Nakia was talking about yesterday. Four, the four best fighters in the Nez Perce tribe being described as one of the other best warriors of the Nez Perce tribe who's laid so low that he no longer wants to fight. He never want, he doesn't want to be involved in the, in, the, in the actual fighting now. He wants to just move with the tribe. Chief Looking Glass did not travel so fast. Hototo, Half-Blood, Canadian French, and Nez Perce knew the country well. He was appointed by the chiefs to take command, to boss the traveling after the trap at Big Hole. Ototo went fast, traveling from early in morning till maybe 10 o'clock before any cooking being done. Red Wolf. The U.S. Army underestimated the skill and advanced tactics the Nez Perce used during warfare. The adapt and survive method of the warrior showcased the thought process of focusing and concentrating on the moment while under extreme amounts of stress. The infantry lost due to unforeseen events turning right before their eyes without adapting to the situation and changing their attack plans. Being unorganized and with communication cut off, an event can turn into the worst case scenario no matter how prepared a group is. An uncomfortable place to be. How can I reposition myself or think of myself differently or do something differently so that I am more in alignment? But I can't imagine having my family shot up and burned and like that and not wanting to just wipe them out. My, my gut reaction here has always been very emotive, but my takeaway is that picture, that picture of Gibbon sitting next to Joseph, and the quote from Woods that's in the theater. If you haven't seen that, you should look at the quote from Woods that's in the theater. But it's, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. White feather. You know how you feel when you lose kindred and friends through sickness, death. You do not care if you die. With us, it is worse. Strong men, well women, and little children killed and buried. They had not done wrong to be so killed. We had only asked to be left in our homes, the homes of our ancestors. Our being, our going with heavy hearts, broken spirits. But all of this is now placed back on us. I'm Joseph, known as Young Joseph during my youth because my father, Tukakis, was baptized with the same Christian name, later becoming known as Old Joseph or Joseph the Elder. My people come from the Wallawa Valley in present-day Oregon. My father's refusal to sign the Treaty of 1855 caused a rift between my people and the treaty bands of the Nimipu. The treaty Nimipu moved within the new reservation's boundaries while we and other non-treaty Nimipu remained on our ancestral lands. My father demarcated Wallawa land with a series of poles, proclaiming inside this boundary all our people were born. It circles the graves of our fathers, and we will never give up these graves to any man. I succeeded my father as leader of the Wallawa Band in 1871. 
Before his death, my father counseled me, my son, my body is returning to my mother earth, and my spirit is going very soon to see the great spirit chief. When I am gone, think of your country. You are the chief of these people. They look to you to guide them. Always remember that your father never sold his country. You must stop your ears whenever you are asked to sign a treaty selling your home. A few years more and white men will be all around you. They have their eyes on this land. My son, never forget my dying words. This country holds your father's body. Never sell the bones of your father and your mother. I clasped my father's hand and promised to do as he asked. A man who would not defend his father's grave is worse than a wild beast. I agreed only reluctantly to flee to Montana following the outbreak of hostilities, preferring to return to my homeland in the Wallowa Valley when things quieted down. I told the others that I would conduct the retreat of the women and children while warriors, led by Looking Glass as war chief, must keep the soldiers away. <laughs>